Naomi is the author of uh, several novels, Disobedience, The Lessons, and The Liar's Gospel Amongst Them. She also writes and designs computer games and apps. In 2011, she wrote the Doctor Who tie-in novel, Borrowed Time, featuring Matt Smith's incarnation of the Time Lord, and is currently working on her fifth novel. The accolades started flowing in 2006, when she won the Orange Award for New Writers, followed in 2007, when she was named Sunday Times Young Writer of the Year and one of Waterstone's 25 Writers for the Future. Since 2012, she has also been mentored by Margaret Atwood as part of the Rolex Mentor and Protégé Arts Initiative. Evie Wilde runs Review, a small independent bookshop in Peckham, southeast London. Her first novel, After the Fire, A Still Small Voice, won the John Llewellyn Rees Prize and a Betty Trask Award. In 2011, she was listed as one of the Culture Show's Best New British Novelists. She was also shortlisted for the Orange Prize for New Writers, the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, and the International IMPAC Dublin Literary Award. Her second novel is All the Birds Singing. Our chair for this evening is Hepzibar Anderson, fiction editor of the Daily Mail until 2007. She wrote on debut fiction for The Observer for five years and now works as a critic, feature writer and broadcaster for various British and international outlets, including Vogue, Bloomberg Muse and BBC Radio 5 Live. So without further ado, please welcome tonight's speakers for what will, I'm sure, be a fascinating discussion about Naomi and Evie's work and the impact of being included in this most coveted list. Thank you. Well, it's very exciting to be on stage with the the bookends of this list. We've got (laughs) Naomi Alderman heading up the A's and then Evie down at the W's. Um, And I I thought we'd start um, by asking Evie to read a little bit from her um, contribution to the Granter uh, anthology, and then I'll, I'll ask you a few questions and then move on to Naomi, and then I want to open it up into a discussion about your work in general and the list in particular. Shall I come up there? Yeah, you I d- wh- how would you feel more comfortable? Con- con- I might, con- just because then I know what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> it feels more proper. We, we all know <laughs> you're reading. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to read from the extract in the Granter Anthology, which is an extract from my second book, All the Birds Singing. Um, and really confusingly, um, this extract runs backwards. Um, so I'm going to read from towards the end of it, which is actually, if you'll bear with me, um, <laughs> which is actually towards the start of the time in the novel. Um, So the main character is a woman called Jake who has come into the shearing world in Australia after quite a hard start in life Um, and there are some dark things in her past that she's trying quite hard to forget. Um, So she has, she's the only woman on a team of shearers and she started a relationship with one of the shearers called Greg. Uh, which is causing a little bit of disruption amongst some of the other men, Uh, one man in particular called Claire, also quite confusingly, um, who is a close friend of Greg's, um, the man that that Jake has started to sleep with. Um, I think that's all you need to know for now. There is a moment that I see things change with Greg. Waking up with him in my bed becomes something that happens, and the small time before work is as as, as important as the rest of it. We don't watch each other sleep like they do in the movies. If one of us wakes first, we give the other a rough shake. Hey, wake up. We talk like magpies, gabbling out the words, like we're in competition with each other. I do push-ups while he talks and move his feet up and down as he rests them on my shoulders. He tells me about his father, who is dead, but who could eat a whole watermelon with just a spoon and the top cut off like a boiled egg. Heh, he was the fattest fucker, and proud of it. Some doctor tried to tell him to lose weight, and he said, What would I be then? I would just be Joe. I wouldn't be Fat Joe anymore, and who would care when I died? Ha, fat fucker. 
and when it's my turn, I do sit-ups, which are easier to talk around. And Greg plants his feet on mine to spot me. He never mentions that it's strange. He never says, careful, you'll get too manly. I tell him the in-between bits of my life, the bits that are available. Learning to shear, my friend Karen, and further back, the sharks, the bush. In the morning, Sid finds weevils have made it into the flower. I don't particularly mind, he says. I'm just saying in case anyone has an aversion to having the buggers in the bread. There is silence while the table takes this in, and it's broken by Alan shouting from behind the wool shed. Something has taken a bite out of the side of one of the rams. He's not dead, just looks like someone tore past him and took a chunk out. Flies swarm the wound. Connor shoots the ram while we all stand around. The animal twitches. Just nerves firing, Dennis says to me, like I'm, an a, like I'm a hysterical woman who needs comforting. But I'm thinking how quick it was and what a mercy. One second, horribly wounded, feeling flies lay their eggs in your flesh and watching the Karawang circle. And the next, in a flash, all is safe. I will learn to fire a gun, I think. Alan stands next to me. Come on, he says. We'll have a drive around, see if we can find a feral dog or something. Connor and Claire move the ram's body out of the pen while the rest of the sheep look on. There is no way of telling what they think. In the truck, I'm alone with Alan. This has not happened before, and he's got something he wants to say. He keeps, coming into, he keeps coughing into his fist and then looking over at me as I drive. There's nothing for miles, nothing but desert heat wobble, and now and then a rabbit which Alan picks off, and we scoop up as we drive past until we have a brace. It's not silent, but all we say are things like, over there, and bloody got him, and a little bit bloody closer. After an hour, when I'm thinking about how much time is wasting and how far ahead of me the rest of the team will be, Alan tips the bullets out of the rifle and sighs. There's nothing bloody else out here, he says, and then he turns to me. I don't normally bloody interfere with anyone's business, he says, and I grip the wheel. But I've been meaning to say, I think it's not a bad thing, you and Greg. I wait for but, and it doesn't come. You're both bloody good blokes, and the thing is that I've known Greg a while, and he's a good bloke. The air in the truck is heating up, and I wonder if I should start to drive home or if starting the engine now would be rude. And you're a good bloke, and I reckon together two good blokes is a good thing. Alan is red in the face, and I wonder why he is putting us through this. Thing is, what I'm bloody getting at is that you've got to ignore the bloody loonies in life. And listen, there are one or two of them maybe in the team. Not bad blokes in all, but lonely blokes maybe. I'm not sure, I say, listen, don't be bothered by Claire is what I'm bloody getting at. He's a lunatic, a good bloke, but a lunatic. And he's messed himself up with the business with the kid. Alan shakes his head. Arthur's mum sent a letter he's trying to learn to write with the other hand. A lot of good that'll do him. Kid can barely read. Anyhow. Has he said something? I ask. Look, it's not even about that. What did he say? I keep my voice steady and my eyes on the heat wobble in the distance. I'm not interested, said Alan. Says Alan. Look, I'm not interested in what my team have done before. Hell, I've got a bloody past. We've all got pasts. You want to find one of us that chooses to be out here without a past. I'd bloody pay to see that. Dennis, he's been doing this whole, his whole bloody life. Fifty years of this. You think there isn't something he's getting away from? He looks at me and I can tell he wants me to know something. And for a second I think, what did you do, Alan? What I'm saying is, he carries on, Claire can be a whinging bitch. He's a good bloke, but he's a whinging bitch, and I don't take any notice of him or of the past. Let's not, let's not forget Claire and Greg are best mates. He's just acting like a prick because he's jealous, but he can't admit that because, well, he's a prick. But what I'm saying is maybe talk to Greg about it, get them to go out for a night together, just the two of them. Might, quiet, might quieten Claire down a bit. 
I'm not forcing Greg to hang out with me, I say. My face is hot and there's an anger I wasn't expecting. I'm not saying that, says Alan. I'm just saying, if we're all living together like we are, might be the political thing to do. He sniffs loudly. This has gone further than he wanted it to. In the silence, he holds up the rabbits by the ears, out of the open window of the truck. Each of them is cleanly done behind the shoulder. He holds them high in the air, breathing through his mouth and watching beads of thick blood drop from them into the orange dirt. Was thinking to take them back for Sid, thinking he might make a bloody casserole or something. A fly settles on the wound of one of the rabbits. He leans back and throws the dead rabbits in a high arc away from the truck. He'd only make them taste of bloody assholes anyway, he says, and we drive back to the station. I itch to get back to work. So much I want to ask you just about, about that. The language. <laughs> <laughs> about that. Anyway, we didn't bleep you. <laughs> um, the language was the best part. <laughs> <laughs> but also, I, mean, I suppose I, I hadn't met you until earlier, mm-hmm. and, and you write so well, both in this novel and your first, about Australia. And it just, it, it's such a presence in both novels, even though this novel takes place half of it mm-hmm. here in the British Isles. Uh, that I expected you to have an Australian accent, even though I knew it's a that real you spent... shame for the reader. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you were born in Australia, am I right in thinking? No, that? I wasn't. You um, it, ah. I think it, uh, in a lot of articles that or interviews I've done, they've put Evie Wilde was born in Australia. Yeah. I think because it takes a few words and saying was born in Peckham, but her mother is Australian. So ah. um, I've spent a lot of time in Australia. I've lived there as an adult. Um, you know, for no longer than a year at a time. Um, and But I, I really grew up in Peckham. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's not the... I, and I think that's one of the reasons I write about Australia so much, mm. is it's the sort of, for me, the polar opposite of where I am from, and yeah. that interests me, rather than... Um, I find writing urban stuff really tough. Yeah, yeah. I suppose, to an extent, you can make Australia your own, because you've... Yeah, you've... You've got enough to work with. Yeah, but I think a lot of I know a lot of writers find it very hard to you know to write what's in front of them mm. because you get sort of stuck with writing an exact version of what's around you and you can't progress with the story and you can't disappear into your imagination that sort of thing. If you, if you're actually there, then the place keeps contradicting you. Yeah, yeah exactly, and, and, and it's annoying. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's also, do you think there's something about um, like conjuring up a place because you miss it? And, and, like, and like the wanting it somehow makes it more, more real in your imagination. Yeah, exactly. I, th- I thought, um, you know, up until I was 18, I thought I was going to live in Australia mm. when I kind of grew up. Um, and, and it's this sort of homesickness. And then having lived in Australia, I couldn't stop thinking about England. Mm. And, and I think it's that, yeah, it's a constant kind of... D- did it exist early on for you as a place in stories? Were you told stories by your mum about her childhood there? Or? Yeah, I mean, we, we would go out every other year uh, mm. from when I was born. We would um, we'd go for sort of three months every two years. Yeah. And it was always at Christmas, so it was really, really hot yeah. and just the opposite of everything that I knew. Leaving and Britain in the coldest, darkest part of the year and going to... Thing. Yeah, <laughs> and going to, like, a holiday. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, because, you know, Christmas and then everybody's kind of cheerful and anyway. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and God, no wonder it, yeah. it, like, takes hold of the imagination. Yeah. Was it, was it rural Australia or urban? Yeah, um, it's actually... Um, there's, on the paperback of my first book, After the Fire, Still Small yeah. Voice, um, that's a, a picture from oh. my grandparents' farm. So it's sugar cane. And yeah. Because there's nature writing. I mean, there, are, there is a lot of dead nature in this book. <laughs> dead, rotting, uh, a lot of meat as yeah. well. I mean, there's a particularly creepy uh, sentence just in passing where your heroine is, is eating meat and it tastes of other meats, which yeah. as a former vegetarian, I think is just extra <laughs> icky. <laughs> But um, no, I mean, it, it, terrific nature writing, and I and I. So to hear that you grew up in Peckham mm. was, <laughs> was a real. Well, it's got its own nature. There's um, there's a lot of 
pigeons with their legs stuck guess, in weed. Deformed, <laughs> deformation, now it all comes, yeah. yeah. Um, and, I, and I suppose also, even in that short passage, the, the sense of the past mm-hmm. was really strong. And I wanted, I know you're going to do one more reading, mm-hmm. um, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about the structure. Uh, we can't go into it in terrible detail because I don't want to give too yeah. much of the plot away. <laughs> but but it, it, at the same time as, as the, the present tense narrative is moving forward, the past mm. tense narrative moves back. Yeah. And it, it all resolves itself and the mysteries are yeah. more or less cleared up. Um, and it, the present tense part of the narrative, which is set on an unnamed British island, has a tremendous ominous sense of threat there's your heroine is living alone on a farm with sheep and something Mm -hmm. is picking the sheep off by night Mm. this strange creature um but but the past seems just as treacherous and it it seemed the structure did so much to reinforce the plot i wondered whether as is the case with a lot of novels the structure came later and it all sort of sloshed into place as you the gun writing or whether with this one it, it really was a part of the original plan well if it there was, was one. it was funny the um, with my first book it was alternate chapters yeah. and which I, I really enjoy but it's it's also complicated mm. and you have to be interested enough in both sort of lines to yeah. to pull it off and and so with this one I really thought I'm going to start at the beginning and I'm right all the way through to the end it's going to be nice and simple probably take me a year be fine yeah. um, <laughs> and um, and I wrote probably about 60,000 words of it um, of both um, of both yeah. sort of strands of it and then just realized that it was better told if you fold it over on itself mm. um so yeah, and and it also kind of felt like that the book is kind of about memory and about mm. things that you kind of wad down in your yes. past yeah. and repress. And it seemed to me that that it was kind of how it worked that you remember your most recent things first and the safest things yeah. first, and you go back and back and back um, into the sort of more distant past. Yeah, mm. it, it, yeah. I mean, it just it works so well because. It's so gripping, that present tense bit, but on the other hand, the past is just dragging you further and further back. And it's like there's a scene, there's a very good scene where the heroine is trying to heave this sheep, this you, out of the mud. And the more you pull, the, the deeper she gets sucked down into yeah. this quagmire. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a, a comedian who said um, recently that she thought that from being a child, she thought that she would encounter quicksand mm. a lot more. Yeah. than she did so I think <laughs> yeah because yeah. it turns out Actually, all the time quicksand, in cartoons yeah. no yeah. a friend of mine wrote a whole thing about quicksand as a metaphor in the 1970s it's <laughs> a big online hit <laughs> I, I guess I've got one more question before I let you give your second bit of the reading and that is just the, the research I know in the acknowledgements you do thank some sheep farmers yes uh, <laughs> well what I, I find um, I find research a bit of a tricky thing that I know that I can get carried away with it and then I won't write a book. I'll just read about the different ways that sheep can die until yeah. the cows come home or something. Um, and well, the sheep won't be coming home. No, they're, they're dead already. They're all dead. Yes, <laughs> mixed agricultural <laughs> metaphor. Yeah. And um, and so what I did was I wrote what I thought it might be like. Um, I knew very little about sheep. I didn't particularly want to write about mm. sheep. I love it's the way you mentioned that you detail them coughing. It's a very <laughs> human cough. It's terrifying, yeah. Um, <laughs> just in the same way that chickens have a very... Chickens and foxes sound like people mm. screaming quite a lot of the mm. time. But so, um, so then I went and sort of checked my facts. I went and stayed um, near Hereford mm. uh, on an estate there and um, I went round and met loads of sheep farmers and it was quite tough to get the details that I wanted because for people who are so sort of steeped in it it's just everyday life Mm -hmm. you know it's like and what you want to know is like what time do they set their alarm for when do they eat how many times do they feed Mm -hmm. the sheep what you know and they they're meanwhile giving you intricate details about something fascinating Mm -hmm. but that doesn't really help with with your book so yeah I learnt a lot about sheep did you get to shear a sheep? I didn't I, they're really big <laughs> <laughs> I sort of thought about it I, um, 
I stood very close to man while he sheared one, had a good look, but I just thought it's only going to end in tears for the sheep, mm. mainly. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you remind me of that thing. You know, Faye Weldon said this thing about research. She said she never does research. Um, she said, don't do research. Just make it up and then go and find out yeah. at the end whether you were right, and nine times out of ten you would have been right. Yeah. Yeah, because if, <laughs> if, you're, if you're thinking things through logically... You know, your brain is just is a human brain, and that you assumes gone... a logical brain, Liam. Yeah, well, <laughs> you definitely possess. <laughs> but I Probably. think there's also a problem that if you learn something fascinating about a sheep, yeah. you, you want to it in. crowbar it in, and it might. Was there a detail that you oh, had God, to no. shear off? That you just... <laughs> no, not really. I mean, I as much as most of my book features sheep, I've got no interest in them, um, and I'm. I mean, the people who look after them are really interesting because mm. they have. You know these deep relationships with them. To me, it's just a blank mm. sort of yellow eye. Mm. Quite scary. Well, the lambs are quite sweet. Though. The lambs are very sweet. Yeah. But um, I think as a meat eater, I kind of just yeah. You want to keep. You don't want to become friends with them. No, exactly. No. Yeah. Just want to. No names. Them. No. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, do you want to read your next sure. bit? So um, this part comes from earlier in the book, but later than the part I just read to you. Um, and Claire, the man I mentioned earlier, who is a friend of Greg's, um, has found something out about Jake's past, um, which makes her need to leave um, yeah, I think that's all you need to know. I bolt from the shower without washing off the suds, round the side of the shed to my sleeping quarters. I pull on pants, shorts and a singlet, and then I begin stuffing everything else into my backpack. If you were so sure he'd never find you, says my head, why are you so prepared to leave? Why do all of your belongings fit in a backpack? Everything is in there except my shears, which I left on the bench next to the wall table to sharpen in the morning, and the carapace of a cicada that Greg gave me last month when he asked if I go to the Gold Coast with him once the job was done. I hold it in my palm and it vibrates with my pulse. Just spend a month at the water, fishing, swimming, drinking beer, he'd said. Get the dust off us before the next job. I put the skin back down on the ledge and go to find Greg in the dinner hall. Almost everyone has gathered for tea and I scan the bench for Claire, but he's not there. I sit down next to Greg, who is talking to Connor about boat engines, and I try to make it clear that I want to talk to him by putting my hand on his shoulder. He squeezes my thigh under the table, but doesn't turn around, too involved with his conversation. It corroded so far, it broke... It broke through and dropped down into the bilge, he says. Connor is drinking from his can and he says, Yep, that's just the way she'll go. People forget. His voice becomes high-pitched and incredulous. As far as an engine is concerned, water's your enemy. Yep, says Greg. And I shift about next to him. I don't want anyone else to know there's a problem. You right? asks Greg, distracted by my fidgeting. I need to talk to you, I say quietly. Greg looks at me a moment, takes a swig of his drink and snakes his arm around my back. Can we go somewhere? Tea's coming out, says Greg. Yes, I say, but whisper it. I lean closer to him. People assume we're having some kind of moment, I suppose, and no one could be less interested. A grey steak arrives in front of me and trays of boiled potatoes get passed down the line. My mouth goes dry. Have you seen Claire yet? His truck's back, says Greg. He'll be around somewhere. Why, what's he owe you? Nothing. Look, can we just go to the Gold Coast? He gives me a hopeless look, like he doesn't know what on earth is the matter with the woman. Yes, I suggested it. What, are you having a stroke or something? <laughs> he puts six large potatoes on his plate, passes the tray, which I pass on to Stuart on the other side of me. I mean now, I say. Can we just hop in the truck and go now? Why? What's happened? Nothing's happened. I just want to go now. Greg looks confused. Well, so do I, but we've got the job to finish. 
Why do we have to finish the job? Greg is chewing on a lump of steak. Why? Because these are my mates. I'm not leaving them a man down. Besides, we go early, we don't get the bonus. It's just a week we've got left, not long. He swallows. Can you just trust me that we need to leave now? I say. He puts his fork down. Why do we need to leave now? What is the difference? Did you rob a bank? I open my mouth to speak, but there's nothing I can tell him. See, he says, picking up his fork again. There's no problem. Everything is simple. It's just hot as all. We'll get to the coast in no time. Another tray starts to come down with sausages on it. When I pass this to Stuart, he looks at me strangely. No snag for you, he says. What? On the Jenny Craig or something. I ignore him, but Greg notices too and waves the sausages back. Wait, wait, wait. If she's not eating hers, I'll have it. <laughs> and he spears two extra. Why do you get the extra? asks Stuart. Because she's my woman. What? That's not right. Fair income, Dennis says from down the end. She's his woman means the snags pass on to him. I wish I had taken the sausages. I have until the end of tea to convince him. Greg has eaten my steak and two large bowls of tin fruit cocktail with the shining red cherries and the pale cubes of melon are distributed along the table. Someone barks, what, no ice cream? And Sid tosses a couple of bricks of it, the kind you cut with a palette knife, and which are bright yellow like cheese. And Connor hacks off a two-inch slice and dumps a ladle of fruit salad on top. Love it when the ice cream mixes with the syrup, he says loudly to anyone who wants to know. And then he picks out the red cherries one by one with his fingers, his pinky held up high. He lines them up at the side of the dish. But those little fuckers can get bent. Claire appears in the doorway with the night behind him. The strip lighting in the shed makes him look like he glows. He holds onto the door frame and scans the long table. I wait for his eyes to settle on me, and when they do, I see a look of pleasure on his face that I recognise. I'm trapped. Greg's thigh pumps blood next to mine. Connor scrapes the bottom of his dish with his spoon, and Steve next to him flicks one of the red cherries so that it darts into Stuart's lap. Stuart gives Steve the finger without looking up from his bowl. Alan at the top of the table is reading his paper and is not interested. He drinks his beer. Through all of it, Claire looks at me and I know I'm done. I know the end has come. He enters the room and walks slowly past me. I try not to crane to follow him. I try not to anticipate his next move. He puts a hand on Greg's shoulder and bends down to him and I tense myself for the end. Greg looks up and Claire hands him a violet crumble and Greg's face opens out into a smile. Good man, says Greg. Now I don't have to get involved with this horse shit, he says, nodding at the fruit salad and pinching open the purple wrapper as he does it. Claire ambles on by, just giving me a sidelong glance. Greg breaks the end off his bar and hands it to me. While he's turned away, I crumble it to dust under the table. I pick up my shears from the wool shed and do not think about what will happen next. The shed smells of sweat and dung, dung, lanolin and terps. I can't imagine being away from it, a possum scratches on the tin roof. I walk slowly back to my quarters, stand for a moment in the dark where I can see a warm slice of light in the dinner shed, where I have a side view of Greg who is laughing, who brings a beer to his lips, who drinks, who puts it down and wipes his mouth with the back of his hand. I bite the tip of my tongue and I try to think of some last minute plan that can stop this. Nothing comes and I turn away and follow my feet back to my quarters. Claire is lying on my bed with his boots on, smoking a roll up. I stop in the doorway but he's heard me coming and is ready with a toothy smile. I stay in the doorway wondering if I can turn around, walk back to the wool shed, hide under a fleece. Know where I was all week, he asked, swinging his legs off my bed and leaning forwards. Come in out of the doorway, love, he says. You look like a prostitute. He grins wider, if that's possible. He blows smoke out and it fogs the air between us. Planning a trip, he says, in the voice of someone off the TV. He kicks my backpack gently. There is excitement in his voice. 
Ben tipped me off about the posters, pictures of you plastered all around the place down there. Did you know that? I had to go and see for myself, but they're you all right. He pulls from his back pocket a scored and folded piece of paper. He unfolds it slowly, chuckling to himself, and holds it up to show me. There I am in black and white, sitting on my pink pony doona cover, smiling for the camera. There's a Care Bear on my lap, and my hands are digging into it. Not that you can see my hands. Not that you can see the bear, or the doona cover, or the old man taking the photograph, or the dog guarding me outside. You can only see my face, the smile for the camera. In capital letters, it says missing at the top, and I catch the words granddaughter, danger to herself, at the bottom. But I can't read it, because all things have gone dark. I rang the number, Jake, and do you know what I found out, says Claire. I don't know what you're talking about. He's not my grandfather. I know all that, the poor old bloke, Otto. We had a good long chat. I went to see him on his farm, just a pen of dead sheep. And all he can talk about is how you killed his dog and how you took his money. And he was only trying to take you off the street. Said you took everything that was dear to him, took his truck even. Poor old cracker couldn't get into town, had to rely on the salvos to come once a week with groceries till he got his old banger working. I saw what you did to that too. Smashed it up pretty bad. I didn't. I saw it. The old bugger cried when he talked about his dog. I just... Shush, Claire says, but loudly. He gets up off the bed in one fluid mo movement and walks towards me slowly, takes my forearms where they hang limply at my sides. He moves me over to stand in front of the workbench and he leans into me, crotch heavy. My mouth waters. I look over at the doorway. What would happen if Greg appeared there now? What you've got is you've got two options here. Maybe I'd be persuaded to keep my mouth shut. Claire's breath is hot fudge on the side of my face. He whispers in a way that sounds like soon he'll be shouting. You can show me some of what you've shown everyone else at the headland. My heart tumbles around my body. A stupid part of me thinks. He might not say anything and is quieted by the part of me that knows it will not end and I cannot stay here, that I have been stupid to grow comfortable. A little bit of affection, I'm not asking for much. I wouldn't fuck a mate's lay, maybe just the mouth. And I can see exactly how it will be, the back of the throat, the hair grasped in a ponytail, and the words he'll say while he does it, and then afterwards, how it will only be worse, how he'll be rid of me, either way, and with a flourish. Or, he says, trailing his finger along the outer curve of my breast. Or I can let old Otto know where to find you, or the police. He starts to unbutton my shorts, and he tugs my singlet out from, out from them and puts a hand down, scrabbling with his fingers to get underneath my underwear. I, don't, I won't even have to tell Greg, they'll do it for me. He scrapes a finger over my crotch, and like a mechanical game at a fairground, something is triggered, and I punch him in the jaw with my right, and he goes down, out cold and, and bleeding on the floor. I cannot do up my shorts because my hand crunched badly against Claire's face and it is turned into a meat fist, throbbing and swollen. I leave the room without looking back at him, but I can hear him beginning to shift around in the dust, and a wet groan comes from him. I'm fairly sure that I've broken his jaw. <laughs> Naomi, I've got no idea how to seg you from that to you. <laughs> no, there's no way. There's no way. There's we need no way to, we of need, doing this smoothly. We need to take a minute. No. Uh, yeah, no, God, that was really gripping. Yeah. I just, yes. Don't you all just want to know what happens next now? Yeah. It's yes. that it's tense salesman. right the way through. <laughs> yes, well, yes. Don't Hope. expect any letter. Mm. Um, Naomi, maybe tell us a little bit about how you <laughs> chose your contribution to the Granter. Ah, collection. well, so, so... Um, yeah, actually, I had a thought as well, not as you were reading, but I had a thought as we were walking in. I thought I could read the bit from the Granta or mm -hmm. I could read something brand new that I've got on my laptop. We, <laughs> we can't resist that. Come on. <laughs> do you think? Do you think? It's completely brand new. Because um, the Granta piece, I just feel for you because you've heard it before. <laughs> well, it's we, brilliant. Yeah, well, thank you. Because we've, we, we've done an event together before, but I have got something that's, that's completely new. So, yeah, where I am at the moment, we were talking about this just earlier, is... Um, uh, I, 
you had just finished a novel or you were mm. a, sort of about to finish a novel when they called for submissions yeah. for Granta. Um, and I was, I had just published a novel, so I didn't have a sort of extract from a novel to, uh, to, to, to give them. So um, actually I had half a short story and um, that I that I'd had... I had written it. I started it in two thousand and five, <laughs> and but this often this is happens to me. Very gratifying. Yeah. yeah. No, it often happens to me with short stories that, like, I'll I'll do it. I'll do kind of loads of starts, and then and then like three years later, do loads of ends. Hmm. I don't know why. And then match them up. Yeah. Well, like they, that, that sort of the end just turns up for the story. Um, I don't well, know. Yeah. Oh. Is that that's probably just me? Isn't yeah. It? Yeah. No, it's <laughs> <too>. <laughs> yeah. No. I think what happens is I I get a good idea for oh that would be a great way to open it, mm. yeah. and then I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And then at a certain point, so yeah. Does it start with a scene or a or a snatch of usually, conversation or an image or usually a sentence. A sentence. Usually a good sentence. Um, uh, 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 there was one. And do they end up? Staying where you put them. The, 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 the good the, sentence that came to you in the first place, it, that's the still good, the opening sentence. The when good it being sentence usually does. So one that I got shortlisted for the National Short Story Award for started with, uh, Mr. Bloom led a blameless life until he met Ganesha. And it was, it's a good line, you know? It's a great line. Like, like God knows what to do with so Mr. Bloom. So many questions yes. <laughs> already. Um, and, and, and another one from a long time ago, uh, which went, I'll see if I can remember the whole thing, um, I had a call from my therapist last night. He was feeling low, just needed to talk to someone. <laughs> just called to hear the sound of a human voice, he said. <laughs> and then how does it go? He goes, um, uh, I said, Dr. Kingdom, I don't think this is normal behaviour for, for a therapist. He said, I think I'm a better judge of that than you are. <laughs> <laughs> so and these, that, and these that, sentences that, arrive almost yeah. fully formed. Yeah. Pretty much fully formed. Yeah, that just turned up. But then I had And no, then the rest of it? The, well, then you sort of leave it. It sort of, it sort of sits Marinates, around in your head yeah. for a while. And then, and then the rest of it turns up at some point. It's just... You make it sound just a matter of waiting, Naomi. But, well, the subconscious it, does its stuff. Does it, it really does? I, th- I mean, I, I think so. Like, like... Have you ever had the experience of writing something and then it comes true? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's not because we're like um, prophets, probably. You might be a prophet. <laughs> I can't. I can't say. They could be prophets. Could could be. But um, I think it's because you're writing with a, your subconscious, mm. which knows loads of stuff that you don't know. Yeah. Like, do you know this? There's this amazing article in the New Yorker about this a few years ago that um, basically you can put somebody into an MRI machine and get them to solve anagrams. And you can tell up to 15 seconds before they know they've solved the anagram, you can see the bit of their brain that solved it light up. Yeah. Right. And then you know they're going to do it. Because and it, there's all this stuff, you know, we are basically up here, prefrontal cortex. And all, there's all this stuff back here that's just getting on with things and not letting you know about it until there's something useful. Yeah. So I think that's what that is, where you write yeah. something and then it comes true. It's because something back here was kind of pondering it, going, ah. Yeah. Well, it's always trying to solve stuff, yes. isn't it? That's what it is doing. So if I kind of don't know what the ending of something is and I'm just fretting about it, I will kind of sleep on it for mm. six months and, and mm. something yes. will... Mm work its way out and it'll always be really obvious yeah annoyingly obvious yeah and then afterwards you just go oh yeah and, and, yeah. and, and, and or or like I mean sometimes I think like writing is a kind of it's an outrider and and, it, and, it, and it's about where you're going to end up somehow certainly this has happened to me that like when I when I wrote my first novel which was about uh, so a, a woman who had given up orthodox Judaism I was still an orthodox Jew but like I didn't know but, that yeah too. but didn't so I that. think I think I think the writing was sort of you know, like like some part of me had already just worked that out. Trying it out, yeah, yeah. Just kind trying of, it on. This, what's this then? I, I want you to give you a reading, but I, it sort yeah. of taps into it. one question that I did have for the both of you, mm. which was, I mean, if if a certain amount of writing is done subconsciously, which is a, just a wonderfully seductive <laughs> idea, and I suspect isn't entirely true, <laughs> there's, there's, then, there's then, you also know, what happens yeah. while you're waiting, and that you both do have other careers, and I I wanted to ask you. You know, is there is there a good thing? Is there, is there a good aspect of having another career? Is it necessity? Is it? Yeah. Well, go on. Do you want to go? Yeah. Um, well, I I run a bookshop, which is um, 
which sounds like it would be... Time-consuming. Yeah, it's really time-consuming. It sounds like it would be something that marries really well with writing, but I see them as two totally different things. So when I'm in the bookshop, I'm trying to work out how to sell other people's books, and that is all I think about. And then when I'm on my own, I write and I don't think about the bookshop. So it's definitely financially necessary for me. Um, But also I think because... um, I think because I can get so worked up about the fact that my subconscious is very slow mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that I feel like I'm lost a lot of the time when I'm writing. Mm. So it's quite good to know that there's something, you know, an independent bookshop isn't the most solid form of work <laughs> in the world. But it's but real. It's, it's yeah, physical. It's something, and you, you can, there are transactions, and you're kind of like, I've made £7.50 today. <laughs> Progress. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whereas sometimes with writing, you can just feel like you're down a well. Mm. And you always. Can't. Yeah. It's incredibly solitary. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. And both, I mean, and Naomi, your your other day job is very collaborative. I think. Yes. In a, no. In I a mean, way that book, book selling also is. That is lovely. It is lovely. So, so I I make computer games is my other thing, um, and I mean, I think I think the thing that's annoying about it, um, which probably is not the case for bookshop, is that it does it does sometimes tap into the same sort of creative stream, you know, yeah. and you can only get so many. Like lines off that cable before before the, I'm, I'm mixing many different metaphors here, but you understand what I'm saying. Like it's a water pipe, and if you're taking loads of things off, and eventually that like over there there's just a dribble, and this is the problem with the Middle East. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know about all this, yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, so that and, and actually at the moment I'm sort of in the throes of finalising a huge story for a game that um, uh, we're making uh, with. with We've been we've been given funding by the Department of Health to make. Is this a zombies run? It's it's a sort of it, okay. So Naomi um, has an, a, a wonderful sort of immersive audio drama app that is guaranteed to make the, the, the anybody who's <laughs> terrified very fleet of foot. <laughs> Shall I explain my game very briefly? Yes. yes. So Zombies Run, which has been our big hit, we're close on a million sales of that thing now. Um, so that you That's know, not a not a number booksellers often. No, that, right? yeah. Yeah. it's not <laughs> seven. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I was at I was at some publishers meeting in in Toronto recently, and you know I was introduced as a sort of as a, as an app maker, as a game maker, and um, and I said I said our sales numbers, and everybody burst into spontaneous applause. <laughs> because <there's, laughs> um, so yeah, so Zombies Run is a um, uh, it's a fitness game. Uh, which you play, it's a smartphone game, you play it by going for a run or for a walk in the real world, you actually have to get off your bum, and uh, you take your phone with you, and we simulate the zombie apocalypse in your headphones. So every time you... every yes. Motivating zombie-heavy breathing. <laughs> Motivatingly, yes. Uh, and every time you go out for a run, it's a mission, so maybe once it's... You you're, you're always run a five, so it's run a five, run a five, go, there's a child stuck in no man's land, run and get them before the zombies get them, run and run. And there's, there's a drama, and I've written it, and... Um, uh, so the first, so for Zombies Run now we have about a hundred missions in total for that app, uh, and I've just written this thing called the Walk, which is more for like less for your kind of this is your half hour of exercise, and more for let's do more ambient movement throughout the day. Let's you know get on with different things, and and um, that is a sort of techno spy thriller. Um, mm-hmm. Where you are you are Inverness Station, about to get on a train. It's sort of. It's a cross between 39 Steps and North by Northwest. Uh, so, <laughs> with zombies, without zombies. Without, without zombies, without zombies. But yeah, it, 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 so it's, um, it, but yeah, thriller. Um, so yeah, you're about to get on a train uh, that when terrorists blow up the train station and set off an EMP, electromagnetic pulse, which means that none of the electrical things are working. So you've got to walk from Inverness to Edinburgh. You've got this thing. The terrorists want it because you've got their thing. The police want it want you because they think you've got the station. You get, get together with a group of other survivors trying to get out of Inverness, some of whom may have more different various reasons than others. For and okay, so I'm in. I'm in the throes of finishing this thing now. There's a lot of and plot. There's a lot of plot. I'm at this stage now of going. Okay, so if we have this happening over here. Does that slightly contradict that thing I said over here in episode 17? It's yeah. So that so, sounds like it's using your writing brain. Yeah, it has, it has, it has yeah. buggered up my my writing head. Sorry to use the word buggered. I 
if that's all right with everybody. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I've been... So I have a novel, which is sort of half done. I'm, in, I'm at about the dread, dreadful 60,000-word point where you just go, oh, shit, mate, oh, I keep swearing. I should stop that, sorry. But you're not just waiting for your subconscious sorry. to do its yeah. thing? I knew there was more to that I mean, story. I hope that when I come back to it, there'll be subconscious. Also, Margaret Atwood is waiting to see some more of it from me, so I really should get on and write it. That's motivating um, as a zombie, yes. I would think. <laughs> so, do you want so, me to read this thing? Yes, please. Yes. Um, it's, it, it should only be about seven or eight minutes. Shall I, why, why don't I just sit here? Do you mind? It's easier with laptop to manage. Uh, so I wrote this very recently. Well, I, I ended it very recently. Um, it's called How to Have a Conversation. There are a few standard types of topics of conversation. You may wish to practice these. They are not very hard to analyse and learn. Number one, life events. Do your research in advance. Is there an upcoming wedding anniversary, birthday, bris, or other celebration? Somebody out there knows what a bris is. <laughs> Have they recently purchased a new home? Have they welcomed a child to the family? Ask about the details of these events. They will, in general, be delighted to discuss them. For example, you might ask, what colour scheme are you thinking of for your new home? Or, is he talking yet? Or... <laughs> What colour scheme are you thinking of for your wedding? Note that it is not usual to pick a colour scheme for a bris. <laughs> Appear to be interested in the answers. There is very little variance in them. With a small amount of practice, you will be able to think about something else while they respond. Two, hobbies and interests. If you are in their home, there may be clues. A set of skis or pictures of mountains, for example, could be the start of a conversation about skiing. You might ask, so, do you like to ski? A language imprinting device might suggest that they are planning a trip. You could say, are you thinking of taking a trip? If you meet in a bar or other social venue, you might ask a more general question. Do you enjoy sports? Or, do you like to read? Do not ask if they are interested in conversing with created intelligences. Three, current news topics. These conversations can become heated. However, a heated conversation is not necessarily a bad one. Do not fear a vigorous debate. In the absence of other skills, this is how they analyse facts. For example, you might note the continuing policy of certain rural areas to insist that their poor take minimum wage jobs doing tasks that could be more easily and effectively performed by simple robots without even basic neural networks. Some have said that insisting that humans do this routine, unskilled, demoralising work deprives them of dignity. Describe a recent article you have read and say, what do you think about that? Attempt to pay attention while they tell you their thoughts. <laughs> it is possible that they may ask you questions, perhaps about yourself or about your views. Do not be disturbed that they do not already know these things. Many people do not find it pleasant to learn a great deal about others in advance of meeting them. They find a joy in the unfolding of another person's story. They say... It's different when someone tells you themselves. Or, I don't care how open they are on the network, I just don't like that download process, call me old-fashioned. Do not call them old-fashioned. <laughs> Tell them about yourself to an extent. You might want to leave out certain details. You might want to appear interested in their story instead. You might want to turn the conversation towards discussing an interesting article you have read. Try not to become uneasy when you notice that the conversation is scarcely challenging to you. You have become used to a very different level of discourse. These people do not know how far you have progressed or what you are capable of now. They will not be able to tailor the discussion to your advanced knowledge or your skills of reasoning. They cannot scan your prefrontal cortex every 0.13 seconds for signs that you are becoming bored or frustrated. 
try to remember that there is a value to the skill you have now decided to acquire. Try not to feel desperately alone inside your own skull, with none of them able to reach you there or to ensure that you are thinking at the very peak of your abilities. Be kind. They will be kind to you for the most part if you offer them kindness. They may share concerns with you about their life events or interests. They may say, I'm worried that Dave will lose his job. Did you see the news out of Kampala? It can't be long now till those machines write advertising copy. You might say, I'm so sorry, that sucks. Or, I'm sure that won't happen. Be sure to give a reason to be fully comforting to them. For example, I'm sure that won't happen. There are some things machines will never be able to do. Smile. Do not touch anyone without their consent. Do not admit that you believe that there is nothing a machine will one day be unable to do. Do not tell them that for several years now, your closest conversational companion has not been a human. Do not suggest that this has made you better, smarter, calmer, happier. Ask if they like pets. <laughs> it must be emphasised, on no account, remark that the only beings capable of pure love are God and a sufficiently advanced in artificial intelligence. Do not observe that you no longer see a difference between these two things. If you were to do so, it is possible that you might be the subject of physical attack. Do not ask or talk about money. The rich do not like it to be known that they are rich. The poor do not like it to be known that they are poor. If a conversation begins about money, they may, no you may, they may notice that you do not feel comfortable participating. It will be clear that you are not poor. They may say something like, money's fine, but the lives they lead. Would any of us really want to be one of those shut-ins, living with a bunch of robots for company? So many of them do that. It's because they can't trust real people, I suppose. Sad. You may not be able to keep the truth from your face. They may notice. They can be surprisingly perceptive about such things. Even if the conversation turn, happens to turn in this direction, do not become angry. If someone asks you a direct question on this topic, attempt to deflect it. You might say, I tell you who I feel sorry for. It's the people with nothing to do all day, not those rich bastards. <coughs> or you might attempt sarcasm. Ha, yes, I'd rather be at home with my robots than here with you fellows. It would be wise to practice the latter manoeuvre at home first. <laughs> Do not tell them the truth. If you admit that you can no longer remember or understand why anyone would choose to have a prolonged conversation with a mind so very much on their own level, they may become hostile. If you admit that you care for your extra normal sentience ab org more than you care for most other humans, not all, you're not a monster after all, they may abruptly stop talking, walk away, whisper to another point, person, point at you. Your ESABO, of course, would never do such a thing. Do not point out to them that this is one of the many reasons you like it better than other humans. Do not judge yourself after this encounter. You may feel you have performed poorly. It will become easier. You have learned many skills. You will be able to master this one. Do not begin to think about yourself differently. Do not think of the conversations you had at the party slash bar slash restaurant slash club and wonder if your e -sab o is bored in that way when talking to you. Remember that the e -sab o does not become bored. Do not allow yourself to think, I'm just like them. I'm just as dull and repetitive and limited as they are. God, I'm just like them. That's all I am and all I can ever be. Do not become dispirited. They would have attained your level if they had had your advantages. Eventually, these opportunities will be available to all. Do not despair of the human race. We still believe in you. That's why we're doing this.
Well, that was a treat. <laughs> that was, that's brand new. Yeah. As is of... This the, the first reading? That is the first reading. I think you're the first people to ever hear it at all. So, yes. I'm horribly aware Ooh. that I think we're running out of time, but I had just one, <laughs> I guess, closing question at this point. Uh, what has it meant to you being part of... Yes. Oh, we've got to... Oh, in that case, yes. two more questions, <laughs> and maybe some questions from the audience as well. Um, what has it meant to you to be on this list? Also, if you want to think about it at the same time, I know that I, th I think women outnumber men for once. Um, d to what extent does your gender play a part in your creative identities, if at all? Ooh. 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 That's a heavy one. Well, should we do what it's meant to us first? Yeah. Can we say that people are... Like, some people are quite weird about it. Mm. Really? Really? Yes. really? Yes. Other writers? Other writers are oh. quite weird about writers it. Writers who aren't on it? Yes. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> older writers or writers who could have been on it? Well, the, 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 so I imagine the, older writers might be a bit peeved as well. Yeah, the people who are most thing. weird about it are, are, the, are the could have been on it, right. feel they should have been on it, yes. want to let you know that you, they think you, you took their place on it. Mm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mainly men? Yeah, mainly men. Really? Yeah. Really? <laughs> yeah, in fact, actually, I think in my, exper in my experience, exclusively men. Yeah. Yeah, there's a sort of little... It's all coming out. It's probably yeah. the same men, to be fair. Probably. <laughs> yeah, it's probably. The men plural. There's about, there's How about many? six How many of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, about six. Yeah. Um, so, six yeah, that, men. Yeah. None of them are here. No. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't going to go on the internet, is that what if it is? That's um, yeah, so I think, I think that's a real... That is a real thing, mm. actually, that, like... Um, I mean, I think it's weird being on a list for, like, just, you know, it's just your name rather than a particular book. Yes. A particular yeah. book people can look at and go, oh, yes, I love that book, or, yeah. God, I thought that book was rubbish, but, yeah. you know, yeah. maybe you've got something better in and yours. Al yeah. Also, I suppose with other lists, you know, with this one, you get one shot. Yeah. It's not like with yeah. prize where you think, well, I could write another book and it'll be a yeah, better yeah. book. And yes. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I think... Uh, you know, on the other hand, it's it's been amazing and you know helpful and fantastic. Yeah. But it is quite an odd thing, and, and you know there there was so John McGregor wasn't on it, and yes. and I that feels odd. Yeah, that is. Odd. But, yes. Um, I definitely think there are a couple of yeah there are two or three people who like um, I would have really loved to have been celebrating all that with them because yeah. it was lovely and yeah. you know and that and so that was. I don't know, it's funny, and it's, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, it definitely, like, it's one of those things where I feel like after it happened, you, you see a sort of uptick in mm. people wanting you to do stuff, yeah. mm. um, and that's quite nice, you know, that's, and, and listen, it's never going to be a bad thing to have on your CV, and it's been mm. really fun meeting people and hanging out, um, I mean, really, I was saying this to somebody on Twitter the other day, um, these, all, all lists and prizes are really a bit of fun. You know, I mean, yeah. there's no such thing as a list of, like, the best writers because there's no such thing as a way to judge who's the best writer. Yeah. So, like, it's a bit of fun in the same way that it's a bit of fun for me to, like, list my top ten Buffy episodes. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know? But it's also not something that, uh, you know, you get a lot of questions about. Does this put pressure on you to write yeah. as if you would or could write differently yeah. with mm. pressure? Um, so that it doesn't seem to, I don't think it... Yeah. I wonder you if we get questions work. like that because we're women. Yeah. I wonder if the blokes would get the, do you feel pressured now? Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and I think, so in terms of how gender, mm. how are gender involved? <laughs> Just address gender. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm a feminist. Um, I try and write strong female characters. Particularly in the games, I, I, I do that mm. a lot because that you don't see that very much in games. Um, yeah. I'm good friends with uh, Rihanna Pratchett, who just wrote. Uh, she was she was the writer on Tomb Raider. Oh. Mm. Um, and and we talk about this stuff a lot about like you know what we can do to move those those characters Somebody, on. Somebody I heard a story on the radio the other day about uh, people who've been taking those really old early games mm -hmm. and rejigging the gender roles. Ah, I don't know about no, that. No, I'll try. That sounds fantastic. Yeah, no. Um, it is interesting. I I did a piece for. Um, Fifty Shades of Feminism, which is a bad title, but a really lovely book, um, uh, uh, edited by Lisa Pinnacci about sexism in games, and or like sexism, and and came came to the conclusion that although there is a lot of sexism in games, it bothers me a lot less than all the sexism in publishing, mm. Mm. Um, and uh, where the sexism in publishing is quite insidious, you know, yeah. and you have a sort of if you have a woman's name on your 
on, you know, if you have a woman's name, <laughs> then then you get the covers of women turning away, yeah. looking at meadows. Yeah. yeah, if you're a woman yeah. writing a novel, then you're writing for women. Yeah. Like that. Do, do you think yeah. that's strange? I mean, you you have you are in. The, more women than men on this list, for instance. Yeah. Do you, a great representation on the Booker shortlist yeah. currently. Do you, do you think it's changing? I mean, I hope so. Um, I don't think it's changing quickly in the no. same way that... No. Sorry, I keep answering. No, you. no, you just, <laughs> ditto. <laughs> um, you know, in the same way that, like, it's clearly things are improving in the House of Commons, but clearly we're not at parity yet. And I think it's quite similar, you know. It's like, yeah, every generation hopefully does a little bit better. But I, I don't think I don't think we're there in any sense. I wrote a book about um, mostly about a sort of quite manipulative, abusive relationship between two gay men, and on the front cover was a man and a woman holding hands. Yeah, and, it is a crazy <laughs> and looking away. Thing. That paperback back jacket is. Yeah, no, that yeah. was. I, I think that fully radicalised me on this. Actually, yeah. I was just like, I'm, I'm right, all right. I was like, I'm never writing romance again. I'm never ever not even, you know, nothing that could be interpreted in this way. Never getting a thing like that out of me again. Mm because I don't want those jackets. Mm. Uh, whereas in games, yes, you know, there's, like, tits all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and guns. But something being testosterone doesn't isn't the same as being sexist. Something like being about men's stuff and, you know, having loads of guns in it doesn't necessarily mm. mean it's sexist. Um, and I think that's, you know, there's a really sort of weird thing where people... Um, like elide something having to do with women's stuff mm. and being feminist, which is yeah. absolutely not yes, the case. And not. just because something has to do with men's stuff, Quentin Tarantino is actually a very feminist writer. Um, but yeah, so in games, like nobody ever said to me that my games had to be marketed a, p- a particular way because I'm a woman, which I like. I like that better. Mm. Anyway, what about well, you? I was just going to say that um, me and my gender. Um, <laughs> uh, my I mean, first it's all going on in the second book, <laughs> yeah. game wise. Well, alone. in the yeah. first book, she has just got this very yeah. mannish Jake physique. And Claire. Jake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that was kind of partly by accident because I mean, I wanted Jake to have a uh, one-syllable name mm. because. Um, you know, in the playground when you're a little kid, the the popular girls all have the many syllables. You know, Isabella or <laughs> people like that kind of are the girliest girls, and the kind of the grunt names are kind of <laughs> less feminine. You know, there's a kind of it starts from yeah. very very kind of young. And um, but I actually I grew up with a woman called Jake, and only um, and so just thought it was a woman's name mm. as well as a man's name. And found out last month that it's her nickname, which is great. Um, but yeah, I sort of and and I think I think I found with the the first book, which is uh, three generations of Australian men in their voices, and it has to do with uh, Korea, the war in Korea, and then Vietnam. Um, and so it's it's kind of dark, and I I sort of write. The, in the voice that came out which was a male voice mm. and at the time of writing it didn't think twi- that was just the voice that came out when I was writing and the thing that seems to um, puzzle people so much is that like how are you a woman able to get into this mystical <laughs> land that is a man's you know world and I feel like I imagined a different time, a different country, a monster. Yeah, yeah. And so for me... But that's the know, question they yeah. ask. Yeah, yeah. I know some men. We're very attached <laughs> to that stuff about gender. We're very attached to the idea that we're so different. Yeah. Um, but actually, I think it's quite normal to spend your time. Particularly, I think, because a lot of, a lot of culture is sort of, you know, made for, like, like in, for an implied male viewer. Mm. Um, but for women, it's very normal to like imagine yourself as a man mm. or like somehow be able to take it up is. their mental position. And sometimes, um, you know, like men quite often write as women, yeah. and no one goes, "How? But how did you do that?" Mm. And a lot of the time, they will write things along the lines of, you know, Sarah walked out into the stiff breeze and felt her nipples stiff <laughs> against her bra. It's always <laughs> like, That's it's not <laughs> what happens. <laughs> You're not I was constantly. Oh, yeah. It's not where your brains <laughs> are. <laughs> I was judging the National Short Story Award a few years ago, and we and we had all the all the all the submissions were anonymous. We just had numbers on them, so we didn't even know what gender. Mm-hmm. And there were three that were written first person female, and I instantly knew that the writer was male mm-hmm. when you suddenly come upon unexpected breasts, just like completely extraneous. You know, I had a shower and washed everything, including my breasts. <laughs> I, I stabbed him, the blood splashed on me and on my breast. <laughs> like, okay, right. <laughs> yeah. It's exactly that. Yeah, it's fe- 
very strange. Yes. I mean, I don't know if there's a similar thing, similar thing for women writing as men. Just, I... I mean, I just, I feel like, I mean, maybe in earlier drafts of my male characters, I might have gone to town on writing about Torsos. their genitals. Yeah. And, yeah. Away. But yeah, but you kind of fairly quickly, you kind of go, that, I've got that out of my system. Yeah. And now I'll take it out of the book as well, because it's mental. Yeah. <laughs> I time for one question. Yes, that's what I was going to, I was going to do that next. Are there any questions? If not, we'll just carry on talking. <laughs> one, one question? Yes. <laughs> well done. Um, so, can you hear me? Um, yes, actually, it was a question for Naomi. I've just finished reading The Liar's Gospel. Oh, how was it? It was fantastic. Oh, good. It seems to be the, the opposite of everything you've just said, in that it seems you do thank quite a lot of people at the end for the research that you've done. Mm. But I was wondering now, having heard what you said, how much of it was you just wrote, just kind of got yourself into the characters and wrote, you know, kind of subconsciously, but in such a completely different period and everything. But I was also wondering whether you got any um, kind of a backlash from Christians. Uh -huh. did, did you get any kind of criticism in yeah. writing about something that was so, well, I'm writing about Jesus, yeah. <laughs> quite critically? So Okay, so... Um yeah, I, it probably does so, somewhat somewhat contradict what I said because I think you know if you know enough, actually. And I think for some bits of that book, it's, it's a book about Jesus. It's set in um, first century Judea. For some parts, I felt I, I, I just kind of instinctively knew it. And for some parts, what I did was I went and... I went and read a lot of the original sources until a moment came when suddenly I was unable to keep myself from going to write it as a scene. I remember actually a specific moment. I was reading Josephus, who's the sort of big Jewish historian of, of the time, and there was, and I was just reading it and reading it and going, oh, this is quite boring. And, <laughs> and then I got to this one scene of the Romans invading the temple for the first time, and he said, and it, where it says that uh, Pompey, who was, who was the invading emperor, um, well, he was one of the triumvirate anyway, um, allowed the final sacrifice to be completed before he slaughtered everybody. And suddenly I was like, okay, now, and, and just instantly, like, like, as if unable to prevent myself, went and started writing. Um, so there's definitely, I think, you know, if you just can't write it, then probably going to do re your research is quite a good idea. Mm. If you've got it already, you might as well. And the answer is yes. Um, I, I have had some anti-Semitic email, uh, which, after which I um, took my email address off my website and put my uh, agent's email address on. <laughs> and, and, and either they don't email her because they don't want to be anti-Semitic at her, or they email her and she just doesn't tell me, but, you know, that solved that one. Um, mostly, from, from sort of thinking interested Christians, I've had really excellent responses, and Giles Fraser loved it, and... Uh, the, the head of Gladstone's Library, which is the biggest theological college in, in the UK, loved it and said it was he thought it was the most accurate thing he'd ever written read about the historical Jesus. So, um, but yeah, and then I get you know, occasionally one star reviews and people writing very angrily saying that it's not respectful and it you know it's it, it it's not it's not the Jesus they're used to. And I'm like, well, that's that that was the point of the book, so <laughs> I don't mind that. Do you get do you get hate mail? Um, yeah, I got I got a hate question once. Oh, what was it? A live question, really? which was lovely. Um, it was she said, um, "I don't mean to be confrontational, <laughs> but." Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Duck. <laughs> and I kind of like gripped my glass, <laughs> and she went, um, "I hated your book. Yep. I couldn't I couldn't get past the first twenty pages, and I wondered if." Uh, you think that that's because you're a lazy writer or if you've got some other excuse. What a literary festival was this? She's a lazy reader! <laughs> <laughs> this is actually a... Um, I was talking at a university to creative writing MA student. What? So it was quite, it was quite an intense Which moment. Which university? Uh, it was... U City? City? City, yeah. yeah. Um, oh. I was reassured afterwards that she was mad. So that was nice. Oh, right. <laughs> yes. yeah. There are, there, yeah, Gosh. there are some people who are just. 
and, and I think there are some people who are just mental and a lot of them want to write novels. Yeah. You know. And, <laughs> and a lot of them do. And a lot of, yeah, a lot of them will come up to you and tell you about the novel that they want to write. And yeah, yeah God, that's awful. It was, it was an interesting moment. It was, I mean, I just went into automatic mode of just like, I have to make you like me somehow. <laughs> so I was just talked and talked that's and talked. That's such and a female <laughs> response. It's yes. so girly. Awful. And then I got to the end of it and I sort of said, does that make it any clearer? <laughs> and she went, well, it's an answer. <laughs> I, I, I hesitate to ask if there are any more questions. I, I think we might... Anyone hate any of our work? <laughs> Somebody did write to me to tell me, to say, this was one of my anti-submitting emails I had. I had... Haven't the Jews persecuted the Christians enough? <laughs> like, yeah, that's the way round it's traditionally worked. Yeah. <laughs> Gosh, how do I how do I follow that? I don't know that I don't know that I can. So, um, well, we've heard about an exceedingly lazy reader, but um, we definitely don't have any lazy writers. I mean, what a phenomenal session, uh, Evie. Uh, Naomi, I can't thank you enough. It was absolutely scintillating, incredibly wide-ranging, from sheep shearing in Australia to the zombies run, which sounds like a much better way for me to do my exercise, (laughs) through to, well, forthcoming north by northwest crossed with 39 (laughs) steps, which also sounds interesting. So, and also I think gives great hope for the story as uh, in across formats as well. So it was an absolutely fascinating session. Thank you to our audience. Thank you to Naomi and Evie. And um, thank you as well to Hepzibar for wonderful questioning. Thank you. Before we let Evie and Naomi go, I ought to just say that there are also book signings if you'd like to read more. Um, So, City Books. Yes, if you want to find out what happens in that. Absolutely. (laughs) So, um, yes. Thank you very much indeed.